So we've been discussing the phenomenon of waves. In this series of videos, we're going to look at one type of wave in particular, and that wave is light. Now, light is a form of electromagnetic radiation that has a wavelength between about 400 to about 600 nanometers, which is at the peak of the solar emission spectrum. Now, the reason that we call it light is because this is the range of wavelength which our eyes are sensitive to, and of course our eyes evolved to be sensitive to the solar radiation spectrum. Now, the physics description of light started in the 17th century with Sir Isaac Newton, and he came up with a model for light where light was transmitted by tiny particles called corpuscles. And his studies of light, he was the first person to take white light and actually spread it out into the spectrum of colors uh, that we know today. However, there was a competing view of how light worked, and that competing view came from a contemporary of uh, Sir Isaac Newton's, and that was Christian Huygen, and his uh, description of light was that light was a wave. Now, Newton, uncharacteristically, was actually very taken by Christian Huygens' uh, explanation and spent a lot of effort trying to prove that light was indeed a wave. And in fact, as we'll see in one of the later videos, he actually was the first to observe a phenomena which requires light to be a wave, but he didn't realize it at the time, unfortunately. So he came eventually to the reluctant conclusion that light was not a wave because he could find no evidence that it was and went back to his uh, proposal that light was transmitted by these tiny particles because light traveled in straight lines. And with the influence of Newton behind it, this model held sway in physics for about a century until in the 18th century a phenomenon called interference was discovered and the only explanation for interference which worked was that light had to be a wave and so for after that point for about the next hundred years physics held the view that light was a wave and it wasn't until the early 20th century where Albert Einstein and others came on the scene that we finally learned that neither view was correct, both were, that light is both a wave and a particle at the same time. And we'll deal with that when we talk about quantum mechanics. But for now, we're going to go back to the simplest possible description of light, and that's a topic called geometric optics. So we're gonna begin our discussion of light as a wave with geometric optics. Now, in geometric optics, we model light as rays. And so here we have a ray box, which is just essentially a bulb with a lens in front of it, and it's generating a ray of light. And this ray, essentially, is the line that's perpendicular to the wavefront. So the wavefronts of light here are traveling along this ray in a and uh, form a 90-degree angle. A wave crest will be a 90-degree angle to the length of the ray. And as you can see, if we take a mirror and we put it in the way of the beam, the ray reflects off the surface of the mirror. So to understand this and introduce a few definitions on how to describe light rays, let's uh, switch and have a look at some diagrams. So here's how we represent a light ray in geometric optics. This line here represents a ray, and these would be the uh, wave fronts um, of light. So the angle of the ray is perpendicular to the wave fronts. Now, this shows a ray coming in and incident on a new medium here, which is represented by the blue block. And we have a normal to the surface. So this dashed line here is perpendicular to the boundary. And the angle between the incoming ray and this line that's perpendicular to the surface, this is called the angle of incidence. And so it's the angle at which the light is incident on the boundary. So now we have our same ray of light and it's uh, incident on the boundary. So remember, this is the angle of uh, incidence. 
And now what we show is we show the light reflecting at the boundary, and this is the angle of uh, reflection. And in geometric optics, there's a very simple relationship between these. The angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. And that's how, for example, a mirror generates uh, an image by reflecting all the light. And so we see an image form in the mirror. Now, of course, most objects do not uh, reflect light such that it forms an uh, image, and this is because the surface is not smooth. So here we have a, a different boundary here. Uh, for example, you could imagine it being frosted glass, and you can see here that the light is reflected at lots of different angles because the surface is not smooth on the scale of the wavelength of light. So this is on the scale of sort of 500 uh, uh, nanometers. We have a rough surface, and so the light gets reflected in all directions. What this also shows is that, for example, this could be the, the surface of a leaf. And so although uh, uh, all frequencies of light, so assuming this is white light, um, are incident, only green light is uh, reflected and the red and the blue light is absorbed by the uh, material. So the result is, is that the leaf looks green because only green light is reflected, and we don't get an image because the surface is rough. So we've talked about the reflection of light at a surface, but light doesn't always get reflected at a surface. If I look at this glass block here, you can see through the block. So that means that rays of light are not just reflecting off the surface, although they are, that's why you can see the surfaces, but they're also traveling through the block. And so that is a process that is called refraction. And as you can see, it distorts the image to some degree. And so we need to have a mathematical description of what's going on for refracted light. Now, when a ray of light is incident on a new medium, there's another alternative to reflection. So what I'm showing you here is a ray coming in. This is our angle of incidence, theta 1. And we have the option to reflect, uh, and that's theta r, our angle of reflection. But if the light carries on into the medium, then the light will potentially bend, and we get a new angle called the angle of refraction. And this is the refracted uh, ray of light. So you can see that the direction changes slightly. Now, the relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction is a very old law of physics indeed. It was first written down by Ibn Sal, who lived in Baghdad, and he wrote it down in 984 AD, so over a thousand years ago. Um, however, his manuscripts were, were not well known uh, at the time, or at least outside of uh, Arabia. And it was not until uh, Thomas uh, Harriot uh, rediscovered uh, this law in 1601 that the Western world knew about it, but he didn't bother to actually write it down. And it was not until 20 years later, in 1621, uh, um, that Villabroad Snellius um, wrote down the law and actually published it. And so it's now called, fortunately, they don't take the full form of his name, uh, and we use Snell's law. It's not Snellius's law. So Snell's law says that the sine of the angle of incidence divided by the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to the refractive index in the new medium divided by the refractive index in the old medium. Now, the refractive index of a medium is defined by the following relationship. If we take the speed of light in vacuum and we divide it by the speed of light in the medium. Now, obviously, nothing can travel faster than light in a vacuum. So V here is always less than C. And so therefore, the refractive index is always greater than or equal to 1. So for air, light travels at very close to the speed that it does in vacuum. And so the refractive index is roughly 1 for air. For glass, 
uh, the speed of light is slower than it is in a vacuum, and so we end up with a refractive index of about one and a half uh, for glass. But um, unless you have a very unusual material, uh, the refractive index will always be uh, uh, greater than one. Um, obviously, although the speed of light uh, uh, can't be um, faster than it is in vacuum, there are some strange metamaterials now that they're making with negative refractive indices, and these are actually used in these uh, invisibility cloaks, uh, which they talk about. Right? This is not like the one in Harry Potter. Um, this is more sort of nanoscale things. They can make very, very small objects disappear by creating a material that has an apparent refractive index of uh, uh, less than zero. Ooh. So we've learned about the law of reflection and the law of refraction and what you're seeing now is a combination of them both together and it's an optical illusion called Pepper's Ghost and it was used on the Victorian stage. In general, what happens when light hits the surface of something like glass is it doesn't just reflect, nor does it just refract, it does both. And that's how I'm able to superimpose my image over the background. What you're seeing is my image, which has a bright light shining on my face, and that light reflects off the front surface of the glass and into the camera lens. We have a sheet of glass directly in front of the camera lens at an angle that allows that to happen. The image from behind, the background image, you're seeing is light that's reflecting off the background, it's refracting through the glass and passing into the camera lens. So we're getting a combination of both reflection and refraction and we have the two images superimposed. This is not done digitally, it's actually done by a, a sheet of glass. So now that we know how refraction works, we have a little bit of a problem with it. And that is that if the angle of refraction when I'm passing from something like glass into air is large enough, I can get a nonsense result from Snell's law. So to understand that, let's have a look at the maths behind it. Now, Snell's law, or I suppose really it should be Ibn Sal's law, has a problem. So, supposing I write this down, so here's my sine of my angle of incidence, and I divide it by the sine of the angle of refraction, and this is equal to the refractive index of the new medium divided by the refractive index of the original medium. But supposing the situation I have now is that I'm starting in glass, and so this is n is roughly 1.5, and I'm going into air, where n is roughly 1, and I have my, here's my um, dashed line, and I'm going to come in at a very, very large angle like this. So this is my ray coming in, this is uh, theta 1, and if I look at this, I'm going to rearrange this now, and so my sine of theta 2 here, uh, so this is my angle of refraction, remember, is going to be equal to n1 over n2 times the sine of theta 1. Now, I've set here that theta 1 is roughly equal to 90 degrees, or very, very close to 90 degrees, and so the sine of theta 1 is roughly equal to 1.0, or very, very close to 1.0. So, in this case, what I've got is I've got uh, 1.5 divided by 1 times 1, and so I have here something that's roughly equal to 1.5. But this is a problem, because on this side, I have the sine of the angle of refraction, and here I've got an answer that's greater than 1. And sine has a range of minus 1 to plus 1 uh, for a value of a sine. So clearly, there cannot be an angle of refraction, right? There is, there is no solution to this equation, and so theta 2 does not exist. The ray cannot refract. So what happens in that situation? Well, here is what happens. The ray comes in and it gets what we call a total internal reflection. So the ray, instead of being reflect, refracted, is uh, reflected uh, straight back into the medium. 
And so the critical angle where this is going to occur is going to be the point, if I imagine that I'm uh, increasing this ray here, and at some point, so um, if I'm below the critical angle, what will happen is on this side, I will end up with a ray that gets uh, refracted. And as I move this ray in this direction, rotate it around, this ray will rotate around here until, this is my uh, ref angle of refraction here, until theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees. And then at that point, once this ray has been refracted right along the boundary here, so it emerges just traveling right along the boundary, once I move this ray a little bit further than that, then what will happen is I will have to get this total internal reflection. So let's write down uh, uh, Snell's loss. This is sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is going to be equal to n2 over n1. But when theta 2 is equal, uh, sorry, theta 1 is equal to theta uh, critical, then theta 2, this is the angle of refraction, is equal to 90 degrees, which means that this is equal to 1. So what we have is that we have that the sine of the critical angle is equal to n2 divided by n1. And for theta greater than theta critical, we get this uh, internal total internal uh, reflection. And so that's the condition for uh, having this internal reflection. If you're less than or equal to the critical angle, what will happen is you will end up with a refracted ray that either travels along the boundary if you're right at the critical angle, or is refracted and emerges the other side of the boundary. So we've seen Snell's law, which describes uh, refraction, and we've seen how this also gives rise to total internal reflection. So let's have a look at that in action. So again, we've got our ray box here, and now what I've got is a block of perspex. It's got a yellow background so that it stands out from the uh, whiteboard behind it. And what you can clearly see is that when the ray of light enters the block, it gets bent and it gets refracted and it gets refracted so that it's traveling more close to the perpendicular of the surface which means that the refractive index of this perspex is higher than the refractive index of air and when the light leaves the block on the other side you can see that again it gets uh, refracted but this time it gets refracted so that the light coming out here is bent further away to the normal to the surface. And so again, both of these uh, uh, points of refraction here are a consequence of Snell's law. And the angle of refraction is related to the angle of incidence through the ratio of the uh, refractive indices. And if I alter the angle of the block, you can see that this also alters the angle of uh, refraction. So clearly, the angle of refraction is related to the angle of incidence. And if I turn it all the way so that it's roughly perpendicular, then you can see that for a 90 degree angle of incidence, I end up with a 90 degree angle of refraction, uh, which again is what you would expect from Snell's law. However, if I turn it back to here, and go to an angle, you can now see how our Pepper's ghost illusion worked. Um, what you're seeing is you can see the ray coming in and it being refracted through the perspex block. But if you look closely, you can also see a, a small, a uh, lot fainter ray of light being reflected off the surface. And so there you're seeing that you're getting both refraction and reflection at the surface, although there's, of course, a far smaller amount of light that gets reflected. So that's refraction, but we also saw that Snell's law had this problem that if we were going from a high refractive index medium to a lower refractive index medium, we ended up with a condition that we could get a, a uh, angle of refraction for the uh, higher, as uh, for the lower refractive index medium that was greater than 90 degrees, and this gave rise to total internal reflection. So let's see that in action. So here. 
what we've got now is we've got the ray coming into the perspex and what we're interested in now is this ray in the perspex that's trying to leave and you can see here that there's no light leaving the perspex the entire ray is reflected inside the perspex so it reflects off this boundary here and is emitted um, going um, upwards now as I decrease this angle you will see that suddenly at some point here right it comes out so here at this point you can see that we're refracting and so now we have the majority of the ray refracts at this boundary and as this ray gets parallel to the surface right so it's getting closer to the surface now right so at this point suddenly now the entire ray totally internally reflects. Now of course since we get both refraction and reflection of the surface you know even when we're um, below the critical angle here we still end up with a small tiny amount of reflected light but once we exceed the critical angle there is no refracted light whatsoever right the entire ray uh, reflects internally. So we've learned now about reflection and refraction and total internal reflection and how these are all governed by the appropriate laws and Snell's law of course is the one that we use for refraction. However, we want to have an explanation of what lies behind Snell's law and to do that we have to introduce a principle that came from in fact the person who first proposed that light was a wave, Christian Huygens. And Huygens' principle was that if we take a wavefront of light, we can treat each point on that wavefront as a new point source of light waves, and we can construct the next wavefront by adding together all of these infinite number of point sources to get the second wavefront. And as we'll see, we can use this to explain the phenomenon of refraction that we see when light enters a glass block. So Huygens' principle is actually uh, something that's very simple. What you imagine here is that here we've got waves coming in and these red lines uh, represent the uh, wave uh, crests. Um, but really any point of constant phase will, will do. And what Huygens' principle says is that you, along this line of constant phase, you can imagine that there are an infinite number of point sources. So every single point um, along this line acts as a wave source. And that if we add together the waves from each of these infinite number of, of, of wave sources here, we will end up with the next wave front. So what we've done here is you can see that you've got these red point sources here and we have a wave that propagates out. So what happens is this is going to give us the new wave front here but if we look at a point like this what we've got is we've got a component from this wave front here and we've got a component from this wave front here. Now the two components that are Perpen uh, that, that are uh, perpendicular to our new wave front will cancel out and what we're left with is we're just left with the net wave that's moving in the same direction as uh, the original wave front. So this is just shows you how simple propagation of a wave works. Um, these wave fronts here add together and the um, if you like the X components cancel out so if we call this Y and we call this uh, X the X components are always going to cancel out and all you'll be left with is your Y component that's the propagating wave moving forwards so clearly for a simple wave propagation Huygens principle works fine now where Huygens principle is very useful is in explaining why refraction occurs. Why do we get this uh, bending of light when it crosses into a new medium? Well, this diagram here shows you the basic principle of what's going on. Here we have our uh, wave fronts that are out in the fast medium. So this is, let's say, air, and n is roughly equal to 1. And then here we have uh, glass, and n is of the order of 1.5. So remember that the refractive index is defined as C divided by V, where this is the speed of light in vacuum and this is the speed of light in the medium. 
And so since n here is greater than 1, this means that v is always going to be less than or, or equal to c. And so here we have a, a fast speed of light. So v here is roughly equal to c. And here we have v is roughly equal to um, c divided by 1.5. Uh, and so uh, we've got a different speed here that's slower. So what happens is as the waves come into the new medium, the glass, they slow down. And this results in the wavefront bending as it crosses into the glass because this wavefront now is now traveling at a lower velocity than this wavefront, which is traveling at a high velocity. And so as they come in, they bend. And as you can see, they will bend towards the normal, right? So this is the normal uh, to the surface. And so they're bending to become more normal to the surface, more perpendicular to the surface, which exactly is what goes on with refraction. So now what we want to do, though, is let's have a more detailed look at this process and actually derive Snell's law. So here we have the same process that we saw before, but now we've uh, eliminated all the point sources that show how uh, Huygens' principle works, and we're having a look at it in a bit more detail. Now, what I've drawn here is let's uh, we're going to assume that each of these is equal. Each of these red lines is a wave, uh, a crest. But really, any point of constant phase will do. But for simplicity, let's assume it's a wave crest. And then here, the separation between the lines is going to be equal to the wave length. Length. Now, the frequency of the light is going to remain the same. When you refract a beam of light, the color of the light does not change. So the frequency is a constant and is not changed by uh, refraction. Now, if we remember our simple uh, expression for the phase velocity of a wave, then we have v is equal to f times lambda. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this on either side of this boundary here. And so we get v1, the speed of the light in medium 1, is going to be equal to the frequency times the wavelength of light in medium 1. Because remember, the frequency is the same. And similarly, we have the speed of light in uh, medium 2 is going to be equal to the frequency times the uh, wavelength in medium 2. And so what we find is since the frequency is constant, because we have different speeds of light, we are going to have different wavelengths. And the larger the speed, the longer the wavelength. So here, where n2 is greater than n1, that is going to mean that lambda 1, the wavelength outside in the fast medium, is going to be greater than the wavelength inside the medium where it's, it's traveling more slowly. And so this is also explains why the light uh, is going to bend. Um, so if we look at this di uh, triangle here, we can see that now the separation between these two adjacent wavefronts is the wavelength in the medium. And the separation between these two wavefronts is the wavelength outside the medium. But we have a common hypotenuse to both of these two right angle triangles. And so what I can do is I can write down for this top triangle here that the sine of theta 1 is the opposite, which is lambda 1, divided by the hypotenuse, which is the line AB. But if I look at this lower triangle here, I can do the same thing. I can write down that the sine of theta 2 is equal to the wavelength in the second medium, lambda 2, divided by this same horizontal line that goes along the boundary. So what I've got now is I can rearrange this to eliminate this line AB. And so I'm going to have that lambda 1 over sine theta 1 is um, equal to lambda 2 over sine theta 2. OK, so the next step is to use these two expressions here to rewrite um, these in terms of the frequency. So let's get to the next page, and we're going to substitute these two values in here for lambda 1 and lambda 2. 
So here's the equation we just had, and what I've done is I've substituted in for lambda 1 is equal to v1 over f, and uh, lambda 2 here is equal to v2 over f. And so since the frequency is the same, I can cancel this frequency here, and then I can rewrite this equation as sine theta 1 over sine theta theta 2 is equal to, um, and now we have v1 over v2. Now what I'm going to use is I'm going to use my uh, definition of refractive index. So remember here that n is equal to the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. And since we've got two media here, I need to put indices here and here. Obviously, the speed of light in vacuum is the same in both cases. And I have a similar relationship for N2 and V2. So if I put this in here, what I'm going to get, well, V1 becomes C over N1, right? So if I rewrite this, I get V1 is equal to C over N1. So this is just uh, C over N1, and then that's multiplied by 1 over V2, which is just N2 over C. And so the C's cancel, and what I'm left with is that sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 is equal to n2 over n1. And if I look at this angle here, um, if I look at this uh, uh, line here, if I draw a line that's normal to the surface here, then this angle is 90 minus theta uh, 1, and therefore this angle here is theta 1, and that, of course, this line here that's perpendicular to the wave fronts is the angle of the incoming ray, right? So this is my light ray, and this angle here between the light ray and the normal to the surface, theta 1, is just my angle of incidence, right? And similarly here, if I draw a line that's normal to the uh, uh, surface here, then this is 90 minus theta 2, because remember this is perpendicular, and therefore this is theta 2. And this, of course, is, since this is perpendicular to the wave fronts, this is my ray. And so theta 2 here is just the angle of uh, refraction. And so what I've shown here is that Huygens' principle that relies just on the pr different propagation speeds in the two media uh, to construct the wave fronts um, is, gives you uh, a Snell's law. And so Snell's law essentially is a direct consequence of the different speeds of light in the two media. So we've covered now all the basics of geometric optics, reflection and refraction. But we can use the refractive properties of an object to build a very useful device. And I've got one of them here. And of course, it's called a lens. So in the next video, we will discuss the physics of lenses.